Services librarian uh, at Southern Utah University. Um, I'm a professor there. I teach information literacy. Uh, it's a class that all our freshmen have to take uh, on how to use libraries. I also teach. Uh, we also have a library media program there, which is um, for our education students, where they can get a library endorsement on their uh, education degree. So uh, I guess a little bit back up for them. And for that, I also teach uh, technology in school libraries. Um, I am the past chair of the uh, ACRL uh, Intellectual Freedom Committee, and I just came up with that last summer, and I'm still a member of the committee, along with being a member of the uh, Intellectual Freedom Roundtable. Um, oh, um, one other thing. Uh, one thing that uh, we're having with ACRL, the Intellectual Freedom Committee, and along with a few other committees, uh, we're on the chopping block with ACRL. They're looking to get rid of some committees, so right now we're fighting to keep the Ethics Committee, Intellectual Freedom, and the third one is going blank, but there's three committees that are uh, on the ACRL chopping block right now, and we have a task force that's hopefully going to save us, otherwise we might be losing that committee. Now, the uh, Intellectual Freedom Committee as a whole is under ALA is not on any kind of chopping blocks, and that'll be around. And I'll be talking a little bit later in about the office of intellectual freedom. That's something that's, I think, always going to be there. They're a, a pretty big part of ALA, so that's not going to disappear. It's just under ACRL, the Intellectual Freedom Committee might be uh, disappearing. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is just some basics of intellectual freedom, how you can share it with your patrons, uh, how social media is affecting, so, uh, how social media is affecting uh, intellectual freedom, and again, what you can do to help yourself and your patrons. So, uh, we'll start off with some definitions. What is intellectual freedom? It is the right for every individual to seek both, to seek and receive information from all points of view without any restriction. It provides for free access to all the expressions of ideas through which any and in all sides of a question, cause, or movement may be explored. And I got this from the ALA website. Uh, this is a great resource, the ALA uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom. Uh, I've got them cited here a few times. They're a great resource for you on any questions you may have about intellectual freedom. And why is it important? It's the basis of our democratic system. We expect our people to be self-governors, but to do so responsibly, our citizens must be well informed, libraries must provide the ideas and information in a variety of formats to allow the people to inform themselves. So we want to give both sides of the argument too, not just one sided, but give every uh, possible view that the library can bring into their uh, collection for their patrons. And so that leads to basically intellectual freedom encompasses the freedom to hold, receive, and disseminate ideas. Intellectual freedom is a basic human right, and uh, not only through um, in the United States, but according to the United Nations, everyone has the right for freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontier. So again, this is an international uh, idea, not just something that's here in the United States. Some of the foundations of intellectual freedom, and again, we'll go back to the United States here, is firstly, our First Amendment. Congress may, shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or press or the right for people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. Additionally, uh, Fourth and Fifth Amendment uh, also back up our uh, rights of in for intellectual freedom. <clears throat> so how does the First Amendment relate to our libraries? Libraries, academic, public, rural, special libraries, anything uh, that gets government money are government agencies. Uh, your collection development. Collection development, uh, 
whatever your policy is, but it's basically asking you to provide a wide range of materials for a diversity of appeal for your population of your, uh, your patients. And most of, as long as it has artistic and literary value, quality. And it also deals with uh, how we get book challenges and censorship and possibly banning of books in the uh, library. <coughs> Uh, just a couple of quick little quotes here for the uh, First Amendment. Uh, first one is by Noam Chomsky. If we don't believe in the freedom of expression for people who despise, we don't believe in it at all. So basically saying you need to accept everybody's beliefs if you agree with them or not. And uh, Supreme Court Justice William Douglas, the restriction of free thought and free speech is the most dangerous of all subversions. It's the one un-American act that can mostly easily defeat us all. So what are some new challenges we are having to intellectual freedom in this world of social media? Digital content is easier to, um, to change or remove. Um, a lot of items are being created digital now. There's no book format in some items at all. And this is especially true of many of you who work in academic libraries. Uh, the databases is everything electronic. Nothing is having physical. I know at uh, Southern Utah, we're down to less than 700 journals we have in print. We probably have over 20,000 journals online and 700 prints. So the balance is changing. Uh, some examples of where content has been changed is um, Elsevier. They change content or new content as well as, as uh, Google Books. They both removed it, and their reason was that they were correcting errors. And under, in the past, if correcting errors usually was the next edition of the book, or they sent out a rata that you would get later on to correct. Also, uh, recently, uh, Huckleberry Finn was changed, where the N-word was taken out and it was replaced by, save, uh, by uh, slave in the entire text of the book. Uh, also, with the creation of digital content, uh, the doctrine of first sale is, change, uh, is changing. Uh, when you bought a book, you could pretty much do anything you wanted with it except make a copy of it. Uh, that's disappearing with digital content. Uh, <coughs> uh, Harper Collins, uh, a year ago or so, uh, attempted to limit the number of uses. I think we were 26, and if you got if that book was checked out 26 times. You had to buy another uh, copy of it. But that was withdrawn after much complaining. And uh, the Amazon Kindle, they uh, had an issue with the book 1984. Without telling anybody, they removed it from everybody's copy uh, who had Kindle. And they had good reason to do it, but it was, people were just a little bit scared of why or that they could just do that, take a book away from you. Uh, so anybody who had a Kindle, if they refreshed their title list, 1984 disappeared. Now, like I said they had a good reason to do it. They didn't have the rights to sell that edition, but they were never informed. Uh, they did get a lawsuit over this. There was a student and a professor who sued them. The student had was using the text and uh, was able to put notes on, in his Kindle about the book. And then, like I said, he woke up one morning and it was disappeared. They didn't get any money out of it, but Kindle or um, Amazon, they. Um, they gave $150,000 to a uh, charity, and then they said, this will do it again. So I don't know how much they learned about that. But um, another thing that uh, happens with intellectual freedom are book challenges. So why are books challenged and or banned? Uh, first, uh, books being challenged, that's where someone will come into your library and say, we'd like to have this book off for whatever reasons. And the three top reasons I give down there below, they're either sexually explicit, they have offensive language, or they're unsuited to any age group. Uh, being banned is, is after they've gone through the process and whatever committee you've created, you've uh, agreed to move, remove that book. Uh, does everybody here have a uh, challenged policy in your library? 
that you should have one. Uh, just to go through it, uh, when I, I haven't done one in, in Utah, but when I lived in Arizona, I was on a, the public library asked me a few times to be on their committee, and we, I worked with two or three challenges, and none of them were removed, but there is a full process that we had to go through. We had to read the book. Uh, we actually had a full questionnaire that we had to go to, and that's one of the main questions that uh, the person asking for the challenge or the book to be banned uh, there was the first question on the book, have you read the book in its entirety? Some people just read certain passages and say, I don't like that part of the book, get rid of it. So we did make the person read it, and uh, we would have uh, discussions with them, talk about it. But uh, like I said, most people, some had read it, some did not. Uh, the uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom that does it on their website, they do give uh, a list of the top 10 books uh, banned every year. Um, they do get a report, or they do ask libraries to report all challenges so they can do this and give a list of them. Uh, they go back, I believe, to about the year 2000, and I have given the top 10 of 2011 here. Um, some are new books. Some have been around for a while. Um, these first four, these are clearly current books. But on the second list here, uh, we still got some old classics on there. Uh, Brave New World and To Kill a Mockingbird are still on the top ten list of the end of the year. Uh, one book that came off the top list, and surprised me, is uh, Harry Potter. That was always on the top ten list for years, and I was surprised not to see it on the list this year. <coughs> So what do you do when you have a book that's challenging your library? Because before, make sure you have a policy in place, have procedures that you can go through. Also have your collection development policy available. So your patron or person doing the challenge can see what your process is for and your decision-making process is for writing books. And I've also got a couple of things here that um, this uh, PowerPoint will be available online, so you don't have to copy these down. But these are some great uh, sites to uh, what you need to go through if you're going through that um, the challenge process. And also contact the Office of Intellectual Freedom. They have a great website to help you out. And they actually have a whole free, hopefully this video works, on what you need to do if you want to help uh, report the challenge or if you need assistance with some challenges.
Okay, next, what is privacy? Privacy is the right to be left alone, the most comprehensive right, and the right most valued by free people, according to Supreme Court Justice Lewis Brandes. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's also the state or condition of being alone, undisturbed, or free from public attention as a matter of choice or right, seclusion, freedom, or interference from intrusion. intrusion. Privacy, privacy and confidentiality. You know, in any library, either a physical or virtual library, the right to privacy is the right for an open inquiry without having the subject of one's interest examined or scrutinized by others. Confidentiality exists when a library is in possession of personally identifiable information about users and keeps the information private on their behalf. Um, what I can say about Southern Utah, and I'm sure every uh, library is different, for our uh, checkout system, the only records we keep in the library of checkouts is who currently has a book checked out and who has last checked out the book. Anything before that, the records purged from the system on a daily basis. Uh, the only other records where there might be uh, a name attached to a uh, item is if there's a fine attached to it. And once that fine is paid or purged from the system, again, that uh, checkout record disappears. We've never had any uh, people come to our university asking for uh, library records, but um, that's our policy, and I think we most libraries are similar to that. Uh, the 1974 Privacy Act, this was an act an, that has been around since, uh, well, it's been in effect since uh, 1975, <coughs> and it's a code of fair information practices that attempts to regulate the collection and maintenance, use, and dissemination of personal information by federal branches, but it's very vague. Uh, there are other rules out there. We have COPA um, and other laws that deal with it but um, the uh, Patriot Act, but some of those are very vague and a lot of them are still being challenged. I know uh, ALA and the Office of Intellectual Freedom from um, right after Patriot, was passed, Patriot Act was passed, they had some concerns with some parts of that about how uh, the government could easily get any information and access from the library. Some other privacy laws that are relevant to libraries are library records. Um, there is no federal law uh, for uh, protecting private records, but there are 48 states in the District of Columbia that do have specific laws, and the other two have a um, executive branch policy. And again, on the uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom homepage, or, uh, page, there is a link to every state and what their law is. So, uh, like to look up your own personal state that is available on the Office of Intellectual Freedom page. Uh, Google. Uh, love them or hate them, they're out there, we use them. Uh, according to a 2011 Gallup poll, more than half the people surveyed said they're worried about the privacy issues with Google, yet 60% use it on a weekly basis. So we know that there's issues with their privacy, but Google often use that. And I don't know if that's many of you paid attention or use Gmail, but I, you see the ads pop up, and it's always related to words that are in your email. Um, over in the top bar there, they'll have those little pop-up ads, and they want to link. That's how they make their money, so they use the keywords that's in their email. So they're, they're using your personal information to get a pop-up ad. And first time I noticed this, um, it reminded me of the movie Blade Runner uh, that came out a long time ago. And people just walking through the town, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but the ads were geared towards them. Just walking through the city in Blade Runner, it would say, so-and-so, would you be interested in? So, kind of scary that they knew this 20, 30 years ago, and it's coming true today. Some other uh, personal issues that are getting out is um, how people can uh, hack into your accounts, I would thought, especially with social media, Google, and everything. And this article just came out in, um, August, Matt Honan, he's a journalist for the uh, Wired magazine, and in the first paragraph of his uh, article on this is, in the space of one hour, my entire digital life was destroyed. First, my Google account was hacked, taken over, then deleted, then my Twitter account was compromised and used as a platform to broadcast racist and homophobic messages, and worst of all, my Apple ID account was broken into, 
and the hackers used it to remotely erase all the data on his iPhone, his iPad, and his MacBook. Everything that he had was gone. And why did they do this? Or how was it done? All they had was his billing address and the last four digits of his uh, credit card number, which was easy to be accessible anywhere. And why was it done? The hacker liked his Twitter name and wanted to take it over. And I got a link here to the full article, but uh, <coughs> how he got the information, how he found out about this, is he actually was able to kind of, he somehow got a, a hold of a, a whole piece of Twitter, because the guy had the account now, and he promised not to press any charges, and the hacker explained how he did it. And uh, how many of you know what who is is? That's where you can go see who owns the domain for website. The guy also had a website. So he went to who is? At the address for the that's where you got the address for the um, forum, and then a website, and also on who is did it have the last four digits of the social or um, his uh, credit card number? So he was able to just go into those uh, sites. The guy was able to call up um, Apple, get IDs changed, and get access to it. So it was a pretty simple process for him to hack into his account and have his entire digital life taken over and destroyed. <laughs> Library Bill of Rights. Uh, these have been around since 1939. They've gone through revisions over the years, and I can read up through them. I'll let you go through. But this is our, basically our, well, it is our Bill of Rights that we have comparable to the United States Bill of Rights. These are some basic uh, rights that all libraries have. Um, books, in other words, books should be available to everybody. Uh, every library should provide materials presenting all points of view. Libraries should challenge censorship uh, in all ways to provide information and enlightenment. Libraries would, should cooperate with all persons and groups concerned with restricting the abridgment of free expression, so work with people who are trying to get your items moved. Um, no one should be denied for, uh, the use of a library. And all libraries should have exhibit or meeting room spaces available to everyone. And again, this was adopted in 1939, and a few revisions have been made throughout the years. The privacy in Web 2.0. Web 2.0 allows users to interact and collaborate with other social media dialogues as creators of user-generated content. Uh, this has changed. Web 1.0 was basically static information on the website, and you just went there for information, and there was no interaction. Web 2.0 changed that. It was coined in, I believe, 1999 by uh, O'Reilly, who comes up with the O'Reilly books, and that's how websites have changed, and constantly, still constantly evolving. And one thing I read that was kind of interesting is back when we first did all these websites where we'd sign up to you had to sign up to be able to post a, a message or what have you. People got very creative with names. They would, you know, uh, Beanie Baby 47, things like that. They used very creative names. They didn't really use their real names. But as you know now with Facebook and everything, everybody's using their real names now. So that's one thing about changing. And people are able to access more information because now you have the person's specific name instead of just calling someone Beanie Baby. You have their first and last name where it makes it a lot easier to get their information. <clears throat> Social media, it's out there everywhere. These are just some of the ones that are out there and it's going to get bigger. Uh, privacy in social media, is this a contradiction of terms? And one quote I'm seeing a lot out there in one form of this or another, if you're not paying for it, if you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. So Facebook, Twitter, all those, those are all free access. So you're the product, you're not the customer there. And another interesting thing I found in the research is with the young people coming into uh, the workforce, 37% uh, of companies research candidates via social networks. So they look you up on Facebook to see what you're posting. And um, get something else to say about that in a moment. And whereas one in five job seekers will reject employers who ban social media at work. So I think this is a contrast here where people are rejecting jobs, but you know, 
people are finding information about them. And um, right now, um, there's only two states that have made a law against employers asking for your Facebook username and password. And it's California and Maryland. Technically, all other states can ask you for your Facebook <coughs> username and password to log in and see your personal information. So who does see your information and if you're a curator of the information? And I'd say I don't know who the answer to this question. It's out there. It's on Facebook. All your personal information is out there. We all agree the end, to the end user license agreements, but um, we don't know really who is uh, curating all this information, who's taking care of it, who's protecting it. And so what are people putting in mind? Put, like I said, they're putting everything. They're putting their personal information as uh, that one not wire, wire journalist did, uh, complaints, bad pictures of friends, hate speech. And that's what happens with a lot of people with Facebook. They're not posting, they're not always posting bad things, but if you go out one night, a friend takes a picture of you, tags you in that picture, you're going to come up on search. So, and what can happen with all this? Again, identity theft will happen, there's cyber stalking, harassment, and people have lost jobs over what they posted on their Facebook accounts or other social media areas. And this video just came out, I thought it was really interesting. I don't know if anybody has seen this one, but again, I'm not dealing with social media. Yes, for all of us, our life is out there on the internet. Thank you. So, what can you do to protect yourself and your patrons? Know the privacy policy of your social media sites. Read them before you agree to them. And know what you're giving up. Uh, I know some of them are very long. I think Apple is probably almost 45 pages, but uh, I know someone did a, a um, Richard Dreyfuss actually does a reading for it, so if you actually want to listen to Richard Dreyfuss read the, the entire Apple agreement, and you got your time to spare, anticipate difficult questions and have prepared answers. So again, know your enemy, what are they going to be the major complaints against you, so you can have some answers in hand. Try to be as prepared as much as you can. 
Don't judge the person, just stay with the issue. Support your answer with a positive. Uh, if they are saying they have concerns, say we share your concerns, for example, we share your concerns for your children, but our approach is blah, blah, blah. Use facts, and if you don't have the answer, get back with them later. Do not reuse uh, loaded or negative words. So if someone says, that book is smut, uh, don't use that word. Just say, use a different word, a more positive word to uh, give them an answer. Again, stay on point. And don't give out any extra information. Just stay with the question. Don't give out anything additional or which might be possible fodder for them to work on later. If you, when available, or if you can, speak from personal experience and be truthful with them. And just remember that nothing is really truly off the record. Even though they may say it's off the record, it probably isn't. Uh, when talking, use some positive nonverbal. Don't stand up there with your arms crossed or anything like that. And take the high road. Don't get personal or critical. Again, just stay on point. Um, libraries are one of the few institutions where we do enjoy credibility and goodwill. And being honest and open will be the best way to promote the intellectual freedom of the community. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Oh, oh, I figured. No, I was just going to that. Okay. Yes. Um, you had mentioned that you work in a university setting. What kind of challenges do you get on that level? You know, we ha we have not. Re repeat, repeat the question, please. Oh, uh, what kind of challenges do we have at the university level? I personally am, or I've only been there two years, and I, I don't know if any challenges we've had. I think the academic libraries, it's usually not as bad. I think public libraries and school libraries probably have the most challenges. I know some universities have had challenges, but it's not as uh, prevalent as it is in public libraries and uh, school libraries, where you have more parent involvement because it's adults at the university, so I think you know, that's why we have less of a problem, uh, issue with it. Else. Yes. What are things that people can do to protect their information when they're not the one that is posting it? Like you mentioned the photos on um, Facebook. Yeah. What can people do to protect when other people post about it? Nothing. <laughs> it's you know you you have to control that person. Really, you can't, it's hard to control what other people are saying about you out there. So there's really nothing you can do if someone says, post a picture of you or whatever. It's, you can ask them to take it down, but proactively, you just hope you got good friends that won't do stuff to you. And don't let your enemies take pictures of you and post them online. <laughs> so, yes? Well, and there are certain types of social media on certain sites like Yeah, and that's again where you got to know the privacy settings of all the social media you use and use them to your best advantage and filter it as much as you can. Yes? I have a question about the statement you made about employers can ask for your login and your password for your Facebook. I mean, it's one thing to, to just go and look on somebody's site, but they're actually asking for the login and the password, which means they would have access to all your private messages and everything, not yes. just what's posted on your... That's, a, that's like really... Uh, I assume these are all private companies that ask for this. This isn't like a government... You know, I'm not, I would think the government can't, but I'm not sure. I, but I, I know there's only the two states that but they cannot do it in. Uh, the articles I read, they didn't say if they were government or private companies, so I, I can't say for sure. But the exam the people were given an exam. They must have wanted the job, so they gave out that information. One example I read about was a correctional a potential candidate for a correctional officer's job. But most of the others have been big corporate jobs. That uh, the uh, corrections official to get the, the person that was applying for it in order to be considered, and he had to hand it over.
Anyone else? Well, great. Thank you for coming today. And again, I'll have this presentation posted on the NPLA website later today. Thank you.